person yesterday. To visit him. So excellent. Well, not excellent, but um, well, yeah. But she, I, I wanted her to speak with us because uh, we've, Megan, we had a couple of guest speakers over the past couple of weeks come in person who both, uh, both the folks worked for uh, the Star Tribune, which is the major daily newspaper in Minneapolis, and, and frankly, one of the best papers in the country. <clears throat> and they, uh, one was a photographer, and then uh, last week we had CJ come in, and she's the data and visuals uh, chief, basically, uh, for the paper. And so this class is all about uh, storytelling. This class is all about, um, you know, basically we've started with photo on a very basic level, very basic, and um, are working our way now into audio uh, slash podcast slash radio recording. And then we'll get ourselves into video. And the goal is to have these folks at least uh, walk away in May with uh, a couple of packages under their belts. Um, and maybe even like a team newscast if we're feeling good and um, the, le the levels of things are, are kind of still on the way down that we're going to we're going to dive into that. But uh, the goal of this class is to get people introduced to various ways of journalism through visual and, and income and then audio cases uh, sound so we're going to hear from radio reporters we're going to hear from uh, you and a couple of other TV folks um, but what I want these folks to kind of get a, a picture of is uh, certainly what you're responsible for um, and what you kind of do on a daily basis and uh, how you got there um, Megan was just sharing for those listening uh, that today is her eighth eighth anniversary at the station. And um, let me just really quickly explain, if you don't understand this, folks, that uh, television, and this is not as important as it used to be if you're coming out of college for a variety of reasons, but uh, local TV markets um, are ranked. New York City is number one because it has the most TVs and the most people. Uh, and I think a lovely place like Glendive, Montana is like number 220 or 215. Yeah, somewhere something, around there. Something like that. When I started out of University of Maryland, I got a job at WBTW as a bureau reporter and it was market uh, 108. So it was right in the middle in terms of how many people are able to watch television in the designated counties that that TV station covers. Since then, uh, 20 years now, uh, Myrtle Beach has climbed uh, to 100 or even higher? We were in the mid 90s, mid to okay. high 90s, um, but then Nielsen redid its rankings last year, back up at 100, 101, right around there. And I say that <clears throat> only to say that the old way of doing things was that you would try to get a job anywhere you could. You'd send out <clears throat> hundreds of tapes um, and you would tapes vhs tapes or dvds and now it's youtube reels uh and you would try to land a job in one of these markets probably in the 100s and then you would after a few years you kind of get to a higher market and a higher market and a higher market it doesn't seem to be quite as important anymore economics are a big part of that um but opportunities i think technology has a lot to do with that i think social media has a lot to do with that megan and i spoke on the phone a couple of weeks ago i think we talked about uh, the young man who worked at the station in Myrtle Beach, uh, the sports guy. Um, now he's on ESPN. Like he. Oh, Max McGee. Yeah. Max, right. It, it was yeah. on Twitter. It was on Twitter yesterday because he completed his first week on Sports Center five years ago. He graduated college and he worked at two restaurants. Yeah. He's since worked in Myrtle Beach and I believe Baltimore. Baltimore, and yeah. now he's on Sports Center. And it that twenty years ago, that would have been absolutely unheard of absolutely unheard of and so good for him i'm not saying he's not worthy of it i'm just saying the dynamics have changed the economics has changed and so i bring all of that up to say that i stayed at this station where megan is for 14 years because i worked my way up through the newsroom and i and frankly i didn't want to move every two years and start over again and i wanted to kind of start my family and i kind of was a bigger fish in a medium-sized pond by the time I left. Megan, I feel like is in the same boat. I'm not gonna characterize your entire life in one sentence. I would never dream to do that. <laughs> but Megan has been there for a while, but she is at near the top of the food chain. And so I was just talking to somebody who's graduating Maryland uh, this year. She's a sports reporter. She put her reel on Twitter. And so I emailed her. I emailed her two days ago. I said, 
you don't know me. I follow you on Twitter. You do great work. I'd love to give you some tips on your tape because she could go at any point. She could just climb the ladder right up to, to wherever she wants to go because her skills are that good. And just because the way things go. And um, I bring folks to you uh, like Megan to kind of share that journey and kind of share what it takes to, to do this job every day. But also if you're interested in advancing, whether it's within a newsroom like Megan has done in two newsrooms or um, through a different city every couple of years. So that's, that's what I wanted to say. I, I, I don't want to steal too much of your thunder. I want you to, to sh fun. share with these folks. And uh, again, um, keep in mind that we're looking for some takeaways and keep in mind that Megan is here to answer your questions uh, about just about anything. We're going to try to share the videos if you want, if it's, if it, uh, I may have to stop because it looks like it's not coming through on our end. This, you know, why don't I just, I'll, I'll email them to you. How about that? And I can post them um, yeah. within our module and um, we'll just go for as long as we can. And um, Megan, if you've got a, a hard out where you have to go, no sweat. So I'll turn it over to you. I'll stop my yapping and uh, I'll turn it over to you. And last, last, last thing I'll say, uh, folks, is that uh, I am recording this and I will post it. Um, unlike the previous two speakers, I can record these and I can post it later if you want to go back and watch any of it. OK. All righty. Um, kind of like Rusty said, my name is Megan Miller. I am the one of the main female evening anchors here at WBTW News 13. Today is my eight year anniversary here at the station and the two Rusty's horn a little bit. Rusty helped me get my job here starting out at News 13 and he actually helped jumpstart my career here in Myrtle Beach. Um, I want this conversation between us to be as informal um, and casual as possible. So if you have a question at any time, please unmute yourself, ask away. I love when people ask questions because I think it brings more of a realness to the conversation. And I know we hear a lot about news philosophy and news ethics and values and X, Y, and Z, um, but I kind of like to go off the beaten path with um, these talks that I do for universities and for high schoolers looking to get into the journalism business and kind of give just a real take of what it's like working in news and the sacrifice and the hard work that it takes um, to move up a food chain and just to get your start, period. Because um, journalism, I'm not going to candy coat it. It's a doggy dog world. We deal with a lot of stuff uh, in the news industry, whether it's print, whether it's photo, whether you're uh, in social media, or whether you're here on television like I am, or um, an online journalist. Um, I'm a little bit of a um, freak of nature case, I guess you could call it, um, for how I got my start here in television news. Um, I'm not sure if any of you are from the Pennsylvania area, but I chose to go to a pretty good state broadcasting school um, up in Pennsylvania called Shippensburg University for a semester. My cousin ran the TV station. I wanted to follow in his footsteps. I wanted to be a reporter, wanted to be an anchor. I had my favorite anchor team um, up in Pennsylvania. And then one day my mom and dad told me that they wanted to move to Myrtle Beach. And they dropped me off at school in the moving truck, moved to Myrtle Beach. And my whole world and what I thought my future path would be on my way to uh, television and journalism um, was kind of interrupted. I don't know about you guys. I'm a mama's girl. I'm a daddy's girl. And I wanted to be very close to my parents. Um, so I ended up leaving Shippensburg University after my first fall semester of my freshman year and going down to Coastal Carolina University because I wanted to be a little bit closer with my family. Problem is, is I'm going from a very well-established broadcasting school, great program. They do uh, live feeds of the football games, the basketball games, concerts. They do a daily newscast. And I'm going down to a school that is relatively new in the area and relatively new in the state. And the journalism program, I believe, was just about two and a half years old at that point. Um, so it was definitely in its infancy did not have technology. I think we had one of those big cameras um, from like the 1990s recorders where you put it over one of the over the shoulder cameras and we were um, 
filming on tape and everything. So we certainly didn't have um, the resources. I gave up on my dream. I, I saw that that program was so young. And I'm like, there's no way I'm ever going to get the experience I need at Coastal um, and in Myrtle Beach to be able to be on television. So I went and I just blindly applied for the school, got in, and I was a resort tourism major. And let me tell you, I hated it with a passion. It was God awful. I had to read a book about McDonald's and that was my breaking point. Other than like the business calc classes, those were extremely hard too. And I think that that was kind of the moment where life was telling me, you know what, you need to take chances and you need to give this program a try and you need to follow your heart and what you've always wanted to do and fulfill your dreams. And so I signed up for uh, the communication major with a minor in journalism. Um, went through Coastal Carolina University, tried to soak in all of the classes I could. We only had two video journalism classes uh, at Coastal my entire time I was there, a writing for broadcast class, and then one where we actually got our hands on a camera. That's how small this program was. I think there were maybe 20 of us um, in the entire program when we started 15 or 20 of us. Um, but we had a really great professor named Carol O'Neill. She came from Emerson, just a powerhouse broadcast school um, up north. She helped create many, many Hollywood executives out in LA, very successful uh, news directors. She helped groom news anchors, television personalities. And she retired and came to Coastal and was like, hey, let's teach some, uh, you know, broadcasting classes. And that's how I got linked up with Rusty. So now I'm here in my career in in college. And I'm like, OK, it's my junior year. What in the world do I do? How do I get experience? Because a, a, a single package is not going to get me a job in television news. And that's when um, I was fortunate enough to link up with Rusty. And we kind of had some very blunt conversations that, you know, I don't come from a powerhouse J school and, you know, we've, I've got to make my opportunities. And that's been something that has really stuck with me uh, throughout my entire career and has become the philosophy of my career and the driving force behind my motivation to move further up the food chain um, in television news and to become a community news leader here in the Myrtle Beach and Florence area. So I kind of took his advice, um, took the reins, bull by the horns, whatever you want to say, and I had to make opportunities for myself because I know that no television station was going to look at me, um, you know, with what I had to offer. I had no experience. Um, by some grace of God, you know, I got in Rusty's TV station here at News 13 and we did a segment called News You where he taught me all about creating a package. I think we were playing Penn State that year in football and it was a, a package about Penn State football. But um, Rusty, that relationship that I built with him allowed me to actually step foot inside of the television station for the first time and see how a newsroom worked. That little experience right there motivated me to go out beyond coastal and find opportunities because they're actually worried. I just had to search for them. Uh, in school, I got to be a PA for Fox News 2008. Um, Republican presidential debates. I made that opportunity for myself. I got to PA for the Democratic debates when CNN came to town in 2008. I got to work the 2012. Um, no, excuse me. I didn't work the 2012. I got to work for um, Home and Garden Television as a freelance production assistant when they came to town. Um, and then I continued keeping in contact with Rusty and, you know, getting any opportunities that I could there. I say that all with the basis of journalism and television and getting your start. It is all up to you. You create your dreams. Find that passion that you want to go after with your life and go after it. Nobody is stopping you, but you create those relationships. Put yourself in those situations that allows you to build up your resume and get that real life experience. And once you do, the sky is kind of the limit for you. Um, I signed my first television contract in 2008 while I was still 
think I just started my senior year at Coastal because I graduated early. And I started off as an online journalist. So I was my more print and PR background at Coastal um, gave me the opportunity to become an online journalist for a new NBC station that was launching from the ground up. Um, it was my foot in the door. It wasn't reporting. It wasn't anchoring like my dreams were, but I knew that I had to go after any opportunity to just get my foot in the door at a television station. Looked for those opportunities uh, while I was at WMBF News. We launched our station. I had that drive to become a reporter and I would come in on the weekends and go ahead and, you know, practice writing those thoughts, practice writing packages, practice getting my hands on a camera and shooting those thoughts around town. I would go ahead and shadow the reporters um, because nobody was going to make my opportunities but me. They were not going to hand me my opportunities on a silver platter. I had to prove myself. And I still think that that holds true, um, especially in the news industry today. It's a lot more competitive here, um, you have to do a lot more at a news station with fewer resources. And so it's a constant everyday battle of making sure that you have to prove yourself. Um, went from online journalist and uh, doing a web-based segment every night on the news to being a um, traffic reporter and general assignment reporter, then moved up to weekend morning anchor and general assignment reporter. And then something terrible happened. I got burnout. I mean, burnout is, is so incredibly real uh, in this industry. And I decided that I'm more important than my dreams and my burnout. And I left news for a year and a half. Left, tried doing other things, tried doing a desk job. It was not for me. It was the most miserable year and a half of my life because I lost my passion. I lost my identity. I lost what I loved. I lost that adrenaline rush and I was out of the loop in my community. And then Rusty came and knocked in one day and was like, hey, we have, we have a reporter position open at our station and a weekend anchor position and took the chance on my dream. Once again, Rusty helped make that opportunity for me. And eight years later, here I am. I've moved up from general assignment reporter to weekend evening anchor to 10 and 11 o'clock anchor to 5.30 and 10 o'clock anchor. And now finally, I'm kind of in my dream position uh, because of retirements and people leaving where I'm anchoring the 5, 5.30 and 6 o'clock newscasts every night. Um, so I'm happy as a peach here. I love my job. Um, I love this community. I've been in the news industry now collectively for about 12 and a half years, almost 13 years. And I can tell you one thing, when you find a community in your career, if you decide to pursue journalism, no matter what medium it is, um, after school, Rusty was saying a lot of people move around. They want to get up to those higher markets and rightfully so, people can do that. Um, but for me, it has always been a quality of life factor. Um, I want to be, as a journalist, submerged in a community that I can embrace wholeheartedly, that I know I can make a difference. I can go out and do school talks. I can go out and do events and meet people and tell the stories that matter um, to this community. And I want a place that is home for me. So I'm kind of the exception to the rule, not only in how I started my career and how I got to the point where I'm at, but I'm also the exception to the rule where quality of life trumps any market that I could be in. You could not pay me a million dollar salary to go work in New York City. You just, you simply couldn't. My family's here. My friends are here. I have a home here. I'm pregnant. I'm building my family. This is where I want my child to grow up. And I think that in your careers, I think everybody will have that aha moment at one point where they say, this is home, this is where I wanna be, this is where I'm passionate about storytelling. So I think that that, you know, in your career, as you get older, that is just such a huge internal conversation um, that you have to have with yourself. Um, I'm kind of rambling on about myself. Does anybody have any questions so far about 
television news and kind of making your opportunities or do have any of you been in a situation where you've had to make your own opportunities or you're confused on whether or not you should make your own opportunities? Don't be shy either. <laughs> Don't be shy. I have a question, I guess, um, yeah. kind of what your day-to-day -day process is as a evening anchor. Oh, well, um, that changes literally day to day. Thank you for asking that, Connor. Um, that's a great segue into what I wanted to talk about next is television news. I am not just an evening news anchor. Boy, that would be great if I could just come in, slap my makeup on every day, play on Facebook, and then go approve my scripts that my producer wrote and go downstairs and read the teleprompter uh, every day. The news industry, especially in television journalism, we've been forced, especially in the past few years and since the pandemic has hit, especially to do more with less. Um, we've been finding that the people who, this is gonna sound very blunt and I don't mean it to come out as disrespectful, but the people who don't know how to do multiple jobs are the ones that are left behind. Um, the people who are the jack of all trades are the ones that are going to excel and be the ones that are the proven winners in the newsroom and those who uh, are kind of most important to the everyday flow of, um, you know, the newsroom. I'm not only an anchor, I'm a reporter. So I go out and I find my own story ideas. I shoot my stories. I edit my stories. I write my stories and I front them on television as well. I'm also a producer, so I produce the sh some of the shows as well, um, which if you're unfamiliar with that term, basically they're the ones that create the show every day. They find the news, they put in the graphics, they stack their rundowns with story orders, and they get the show on air. Um, I can go ahead and edit and I'm also, now that I'm one of the veterans here at the station, I also train all of our new producers too and then help provide uh, you know, advice when our managers need it uh, as well with new hires. Like right after I get off the Zoom call, I'm getting ready to go and interview an MMJ candidate because um, we have some reporter positions open right now. So the day-to-day -day, day -day schedule for me, it just all depends on what I'm walking into um, that day. Some days I am producing an entire show before I go downstairs and anchor. Um, right now I'm working on two feature stories. So I've been out in some of our inland counties this week, um, shooting my stories and interviewing the people um, that I need to interview. And yesterday I spent my entire day logging interviews, which takes a lot longer than a lot of, a lot of people think, and writing my stories to get approved. Later on today, after I'm done this talk and my interview, I'm going to go ahead and track my packages that I need to get tracked and start editing them because next week I've got to start training a new producer, which is like a two and a half um, week process here. And then within all of that, by three o'clock, I've got to start approving the scripts that um, my our producers wrote for us for the shows. I've got to do a Facebook Live to get people to watch the five o'clock newscast and we've got to showcase our personalities more. So I've got to do a Facebook Live at 4.30, do a live tease at 4.53 and then the news for an hour and a half and try to fit in a lunch break in there somewhere and still be interactive on social media and helping our newsroom find stories and helping our reporters make sure that they are actually turning their content for the day. So. Um, I don't know if that answered your question. It's very busy, but, um, you know, it really, the day and the workflow as a news anchor really all depends on your skill set and how heavily reliant you are uh, by your management to kind of pitch in. Because TV news, especially in newsroom, it's an all hands on deck effort. If one person is out sick, we've all just got to pull together um, and help that person help fill that void that that person has left for the day. So right now we're in a contract cycle and losing people. So it's really all hands on deck and it's a busy time for me just because I can perform uh, in so many roles and I can get the job done uh, in so many roles. But 
that goes without saying that I know Rusty's the same way when he was an anchor here, he used to shoot and edit and write and find his own stories. Um, I love that. Like, I am so happy that I'm one of those journalists who still has that connection, not only to my community, not only to my station, but also to my craft as well. And that's so important to have because I can't lead a newsroom as an anchor and as a veteran and as a mentor here in the newsroom, if I don't know what my kids are going through. And I call them kids now, I'm 30, gonna be 35. So I'm like, I'm one of the older people here at the station. And as you get older in your journalism career, that's always something so important to remember, never to forget where you came from and to give yourself a reminder every once in a while of where exactly you came from. It's a good reality check. For everyone how many uh how many of you after hearing that all of that uh, <laughs> are, uh, are are still interested in, in pursuing a career in local television journalism I, I, seriously like are anyone you will coming, not offend me no anyone coming into this thinking i'd like to be a reporter or eventually an anchor or something like that seriously a show of hands or t- turn your camera on if you need to were any of you thinking are any of you thinking that that's something you would like to do there you go. Okay. We got That's Connor. Cool. That's cool. Carissa. Okay. Yeah. Now, Good. how many, how many of those people have, have maybe are reconsidering after, after hearing what Megan had to say? No, no hands. <laughs> no, of course. That's not, that's not at all the point, the point, obviously, but it, you know, um, Megan does it all and Megan wants to do it all well, and she's yeah. not going to do anything half-assed. And so, um, she takes on a lot and a lot is expected of her. A lot was expected of me when I was there. And, um, but we made it happen. And the thing that I'm finding is that, and I was just talking to um, a former colleague of ours there that um, we have to like, un, we, we're trying, it's, it's hard to leave that job and yeah. de- deprogram. Maybe that's why I have three jobs now. It's like, I fill my oh, life huh. with other yeah. things because the main job that I have is one show a week recorded uh, and this week we're not doing a show uh, because (laughs) yeah and I can go out and turn as many packages stories as I want or not and then anchor the show and I edit the show but every day I was doing a lot of what Megan just described I was going out and finding by the end of the time there I was working Fridays to set up the next week and I was doing feature stories that could be set up ahead of time but she made a great point about um, the Jack or Jills of all trades being able to really excel when the challenge of the pandemic and all these other things, or again, economic uh, problems. I was there during two cycles of furloughs and layoffs. My co-anchor was laid off right next to me. She and I did the same thing every day, but they laid her off and I don't, it shook me up. It shook me up. That's one of the reasons I eventually left. It's just because like, I want to get out of this on my own terms before they send me packing. But it's tough. It, it, no matter if it's not just TV journalism, what, what Liz does, I think you all picked up on what Liz said a couple of weeks ago. She's a photographer, a photojournalist. It's tough. It's, it's challenging. And it's, it's it, either you embrace that or you don't. And yeah. it's okay if you don't. That doesn't make you less of a person or less of a journalist or less of a uh, someone who wants to contribute. It's just, it's crazy. It's just madness. And I'll say this, and I remind everybody of this, and I remind anybody, even if they've been there as long as Megan, the news never stops. It no. never, ever stops. Not for Christmas, not for your mama, not for your honeymoon, not for you know Columbus Day. It does not stop. You have to produce every day it's not about what you did yesterday oh i did this great story yesterday and we were live and it was raining and we got the we got the the crying mother and we got the mayor who was in handcuffs it doesn't matter what what do you got today because we got three hours this afternoon to film it's it's relentless um but there's reward in that and i think that megan has has shared that what other questions go ahead i'm sorry go ahead meg oh yeah just going off of you know rusty's Um, point about being tough that's kind of like the scary part of news but being in news is just such a beautiful thing there are days trust me where I literally curse his name still and I'm like 
pardon my French, Megan, why the hell did you let Rusty talk you to getting back in news? And there are days where I go in our bathroom and I just cry because I'm so overwhelmed. But I know deep down in my heart that I have a servant's heart and this is how I can serve my community. When I tried getting out of news and working a desk job, I tried going into PR. Um, I was an e-commerce manager for one of the largest um, hotel chains here at the beach, left there and then was a PR manager and marketing specialist for um, one of our local cancer centers. My husband is, um, at the time he was a firefighter, he's an assistant chief now for the county that we live in. And we would sit at the dinner table and he would have his fire scanner sitting. It's like our third wheel uh, at the dinner. And I would be hearing all of these calls go out. And I remember, I think I texted Rusty when we had the big Windsor Green apartment fire, like, yo dog, you guys need to get people out here. There's literally an entire apartment complex burning down right across the street from my neighborhood. Um, but once you have that love of news embedded in your heart, it is so, so stinking hard to get rid of it because you find yourself just eating, sleeping, breathing, and sacrifice, sacrificing for news. And I knew that I lost my identity. I made my identity off of being a reporter in this community and an anchor in this community. And it was like, I went through a very toxic breakup with myself and with the news station. And it was extremely mentally hard. Got depressed, was unhappy with myself, you know, just angry at the world. But then once I got back into news, it's like I found my found my soul again. I found myself again, my identity, my purpose. And I think, you know, being in television news and being in journalism, we have the purpose of, you know, telling the stories of our community and the stories that matter to the people, whether they're good, bad, beautiful, or ugly. But I also think that the other beautiful part of being in news is being one with your community and that incredible irreplaceable connection that you make with your community. I never thought that I could, you know, never thought that I could do this whatsoever, but the community gives you confidence to continue serving them. And the relationships that you build as a journalist, no matter if you're on social, if you're on web, if you're on print, or if you're on television news or on radio, they are the most beautiful relationships you will ever make in your life. And it is so beautiful to watch those professional relationships then turn into personal relationships and you meet family friends out of it. And it's just, you know, the on the tough days where it's like, I can't go on, I can't do news anymore. If you ever have those, just remember deep down inside the purpose and the importance of the work that you're doing and how your community depends on you um, and the beautiful, wonderful people that this job and this opportunity brought into your life. And I, that hands down is the best part of journalism. It's breaking news is great. Getting the scoop is great, but I truly feel like this is home because of the relationships that I've built and the friendships that I've built and you know, the stories I've told because of that hard work of relationship building, that, that makes it all worth it at the end of the day. That is the beautiful side um, of journalism that I don't think people talk enough about because it is, it is something else. It and, something else. and you get to live at the beach. And I get to live at the beach. I, I don't know if you can see behind me, but we got new lights and they're kind of like, oh yeah. It's like we're in a spaceship now. We got these new LED lights. But anyways, that's newsroom um, behind me. And then just probably what, like five minutes away from here? Yeah. Three minutes? It, maybe like a mile and a half is literally the sand. And you just, you can't beat that. Uh, <laughs> we're, spo we're spoiled here. It's it's uh, 15 it's 15 degrees here. So. Uh, oh, you, you brought it up. I wasn't going to um, say anything. Let me app here right now um it's 52 degrees here right now which by the way guys is extremely 12. cold for here it's 12 very actually. Cold. 12 oh okay 
it's going to be the high of 63 here today, 68 tomorrow, and 70 degrees on Saturday. But then it gets cold again to 55. Well, so. I'm, I'm flying to Charlotte. <laughs> I'm flying to Charlotte this afternoon. I'm going to be wearing shorts most of the weekend. So I'm, Fantastic. it's fine. Uh, let's talk about other things. Uh, can you talk for a minute about storytelling? You, Megan um, is a far better now photographer and editor than I ever am or will be. And uh, she sent me a few of her stories here recently, but she's responsible for telling stories. She's responsible for carrying a camera, a tripod, a microphone, sometimes a light and yeah. um, putting it in people's faces and getting them to tell her subjective things. We've talked about subjective versus objective information. Uh, and she's she turns in really incredible stories. Can you talk to these folks a little bit about when you hear a story idea or when you pitch a story idea? um what you're thinking already even as you're driving to where you're going to interview or or shoot some video are you already thinking about what it is you need to walk back in the door with video and oh. sound wise so freaking lovely absolutely i just love um as soon as i see a story or pitch a story that i find on my own automatically my imagination is just going nuts i'm very high strung when it comes to that stuff and um I'm visualizing the shots that I want to do, that I want to do, the um, nat pop sequences maybe that I want to shoot for this story, how I want my interview angle to look, what kind of background I want um, in my interview. All of those things are just going in my head because, and I think that, you know, the basis for being able to shoot well is to understanding your story well prior to even getting there that's very stressful when you go on a story and you don't know what you're going to expect and it's just a loose bag of marbles that's just you know flying and rolling everywhere so i'm very ocd in the fact that when i pitch my stories i pitch them methodically and i make sure that when i pitch them i say okay i want this visual i want this b-roll i want this person to be my interview because i know that I've got these facts and I can expect them to react a certain way. And that helps me get my story flow. Um, boy. Perfect example of when I failed to do that um, was this week. <laughs> Unfortunately, I was in Marion County, which is the next county over. And I am doing um, two feature stories for a Remarkable Women series. And one of them is for the victim advocate for one of our local sheriff's office. And she's also the handler of the sheriff's office comfort dog. And it's the first comfort therapy dog any sheriff's office has had in the state of South Carolina. I knew exactly, you know, going into it, the shots that I want. I'm a dog lover, obsessed with my golden retriever, obsessed with anything with four legs. And I let that distraction get to me on my shoot. And so I came back to the station, basically with all shots of this woman playing playing ball and playing fetch and walking around with this therapy dog. And I lost sight of, you know, how I truly visually wanted to tell the story. So guess what? I got to drive back to Marion County here pretty soon and get more shots of her, you know, in a courtroom and me and working at her desk and X, Y, and Z. Um, but that I say all of that in, in reference to when you get on a story shoot, make sure that you're as calm as possible and you know what you want and you have that internal checklist of shots that you want you know how you want the story uh, to come out sometimes you know the interview might surprise you and it might be better than your wildest dreams or it might be worse than your scariest nightmares um, and you have to let your instincts and your experience help fix all of that um, I hope that answers that question I kind of went on a little a little ramble there, but you know, it's, um, it's very important for me to shoot my own stuff. Um, I have struggled very hard working with a photographer. I had one, um, on my shoot on Monday and I think <laughs> Rusty's smirking because, um, it, it was our PD reporter and he's very high energy and all over the place. And that let me distract myself, uh, as well, but, uh, you got to know what you want going into it and when you're in the moment you know and you're out there shooting your story take a deep breath and just let everything sink in for a second look around take in your surroundings and when you do that you're going to find 
things that maybe your blinders, you know, were blocking off originally going into the story, but it also um, allows you to feel that moment and feel that environment. And then you can portray that into your writing and then into your shooting. Um, like I said, I'm a big fan of nap pop sequences, especially right off the top of a package. You got to explain what that is. Um, nap pop sequence is when you hear like some natural sound and then it's like a sequence of shots that fit together just right. Like um, somebody doing something that's shot at different angles and dip different depths, I guess you could say. I wish I had an example of what that was. Um, but I'm always looking for those nap pop sequences. And then I like to challenge myself by um, making sure that my video has great depth and to find different angles to shoot things at. Because nobody likes to look at static video where you're just panning across, wide, medium, tight, wide, medium, tight. You have no movement whatsoever um, in your video. So for me on shoots, getting those angles, getting the depth, and taking the darn camera off the tripod too and, and having some movement in there, you know, is something that can really take your storytelling um, to the next level. Hey, hey, she said wide, medium, tight. How about that? We've been talking uh, all we've been talking oh, all about that. How about oh, that? Oh man, I just got can't do it. <laughs> I can't. It all fits together. <laughs> Look at that. Rusty might know what he's talking about. I'm just kidding. Um, is there a story in eight, 12 years that sticks out to you for whatever reason, whether it was a thousand percent everything you wanted it to be, or it was a struggle or anything like that. Is there any single story uh, that you've worked on or you've reported from uh, that sticks out to you? Oh, that's a hard one. There's been so many. There's been so many. Um, I think that the ones that are always the hardest for me to report on and for me to anchor and help build our in-studio coverage is our line of duty deaths. Um, again, I'm a fire wife. I have that personal connection to our public safety um, community. And I've had many of friends who have been killed. Um, and that is an especially difficult time for me as both a storyteller and reporter and as an anchor to separate personal from professional. And it's always important that you keep those separate. Um, just like when you're storytelling, it's black, white, we don't want the gray because gray is where you have the room for assumptions. And um, we went through an extremely hard year here uh, last year. We had multiple, multiple line of duty deaths. Um, we had two, we had a police officer get killed on New Year's Day that my husband and I both knew from his old department because he hydroplaned and rammed his patrol car right into an electric pole and was killed. We had um, in Marion County, a sheriff's deputy run into, in a high, while he was responding to a call into the side of an overpass. We had another one that was killed in a high-speed chase. He got T-boned, I believe it was, um, out in Marion County. We've had firefighters killed and whatnot. And those are always, um, I think, the hardest stories for me to cover. But also they're the stories that allow me to show our viewers that I'm human too, that I have emotions because that is so important in the viewer anchor or viewer reporter or viewer storyteller uh, dynamic is yes I'm on your television you know telling stories every single day but as a human that also what's coming out of my mouth deeply deeply affects me and we had um last was it last October of 2020 it was um, got woken up in the middle of the night. My husband's like, oh my God, I I've got to go. I've got to go. His phone was going off and everything. And here, um, a Myrtle Beach police officer was shot in point range, um, during a check. I think he was uh, responding to an assault call, a domestic violence call. Dude came up with, um, automatic rifle just, and plowed him down. The poor boy was responding on a call. Um, and he was very young, not much older than
than you guys. And he happened to also be a volunteer firefighter for my husband's fire department. Um, that was probably the hardest week of my career emotionally. And I still get emotional over it because I care so much about this community and this community deeply hurt during that. Um, it was so hard for me that I cried on air and I'm not sorry for crying on air during the live shot, but we had to do a live show right outside where this poor kid um, was killed. And like going back to Rusty's, you know, um, point about news never sleeps. I was up at one o'clock helping my station confirm information, offering to drive to the hospital to get police procession video, offering to come in to anchor our coverage that we're going to have the next day or go out to the scene to assist our reporters um, and whatnot. But those are the hardest stories for me to always tell is when something happens in our community that deeply, deeply hurts it. Um, and we have a lot of fun stories though. <laughs> we get to tell, I got to go play with sharks on a shark boat the other week and, and catch sharks um, back in October. So like, those are the fun stories, you know, that we get to go on uh, and get to use just whatever resources we have on. So those are, we do have fun stories too, but um, there's definitely a distinct difference between the hard stories that we tell and the fun stories that we get to tell. Uh, any questions uh, for Megan? Don't be shy. I know it's early out there. Yeah, I got a question. All right, go for it. How has your interviewing process changed and evolved as you've matured as a journalist and reporter? You know, as when I came out of school, it was all about the who, what, when, where, why. Those are our basis questions for journalism. Um, I feel like being a part of a community so long has allowed me to truly understand the dynamics of the people that I'm working with. And I think when you're interviewing, you need to understand the dynamic of the situation, um, of the story that you're telling, but also understand the dynamic of the person who you're interviewing. So I think interviewing has actually gotten easier for me over the years because I know these people so well and I know how they're gonna react to me. I know if I'm gonna get, um, a hard time. Oh, do we have to talk? I don't want, I don't want to interview. I don't want to be on camera or somebody who comes up and say, Hey, let's do this interview. You know, let's rock and roll. I know who I'm going to get the good sound bites from. I know who I'm going to get the bad sound bites from who I'm going to have trouble logging or have to cut out ums from. So, um, I try to tailor my interviewing and my questions that I ask to each individual person. If I know that I can get really good emotional sound bites, out of someone or a soundbite that ex is explaining something in layman's terms and very easily, I might ask them a little bit more of a complex question, maybe like a, a two-part question or a three-part question, because I know if I ask those questions together, that person is just going to ramble on and they're just, it's going to open the door to a nice long soundbite that I know that I'm going to be able to chop up. But for folks who maybe have never been on television before, maybe it's a man on the street thought that I'm getting, um, somebody who might be nervous or taken aback that I'm you know, coming to interview with them, that's when I try to be a calm and warming person behind the camera instead of just sticking my camera right in their face. But I also make sure to coach them before, like it's gonna be okay. I will not make you look dumb on television. And if you mess up, you know, we chop that out from, you know, in post edit. But I also ask them simpler questions too, because that'll allow me to get more of a concise sound bite. And it also gives me a, let, a smaller chance of the ums and the uhs and the, well, you know, and the so's and whatnot. So it really all depends on the dynamic of the person and the situation that I'm in. Um, but I think that that has actually been one of the great things about staying in a market and knowing its people for so long is I know who I can go hard with on an interview and who I need to take it kind of easy on. And they know they it's it's black and white with me, um, especially when we're doing the hard stories, you know, beforehand. And when I meet new people, it's like, I may need to come to you for a hard story that's going to be very uncomfortable for the both of us 
to do and going to be uncomfortable for you and may not paint you and you or your organization um, in the best light, but it's better to be upfront and truthful with me and just do this interview rather than running away with your tail between your legs, because that's as a journalist, when my red flags go up and say something's a little fishy here. So people always um, know my philosophy that it is strictly interviewing and the hard questions are professional. It's not necessarily personal. So I think that you guys will be able, once you start landing in your markets and getting comfortable with your jobs and stuff, you'll understand that dynamic and interviewing while it may seem like a daunting process will become much, much easier for you. And you'll know how you like to word your questions too and what's comfortable for you. Anything other, else? Other questions, ask away. Oh, I know we've had our come coffee on, this morning. Come on. I know there's more questions out there. Megan, I think she's proven she's not shy to, to, to tell you <laughs> what she's thinking. Got any? Man. I had lunch this morning. That's okay. I was rambling on as tough, well. Tough crowd. Uh, is Quiggs there today? Um, Quiggs is holed up in his uh, edit bay. Yes, he is. All right. Maybe after we let these folks go, if he's there, I'd like to say hi to him. Oh, absolutely. He's absolutely. one of my uh, former students at Coastal. Um, any questions for Megan about um, storytelling, about TV news, um, about what she's looking for or passionate about with these stories? Anything else for her? Now's the time to ask. I have a oh, question. No. Ah. Yeah, go ahead, Hunter. Um, uh, I was just going to ask if I know you said before you really wanted to stay, you know, in a community and in that market, but have you ever had or see yourself in the future going to a bigger market or hopefully advancing on to just a bigger market in general? I've always had those fantasies and I don't think that any journalist does not have those fantasies um, because it's sometimes it's like, oh man, my friends are moving up to bigger and better things. And, you know, would, how would that life experience, you know, shape me as a person? Because I have many friends in this business who have moved around to multiple markets, but I also have many friends in the business who have stayed in their markets as well. I almost went to um, our capital um, market here in South Carolina, Columbia. I got offered a job at WIS, um, but I was doing three different jobs and they were only going to pay me $22,000 a year. And I knew that, um, yeah, I may be jumping in market size a little bit, not too much, but a little bit and be getting, you know, capital reporting and assignment editing and, you know, online journalism experience. But again, that's where the quality of life conversation came into play for me. I would be taking a pay cut, working in a more expensive city and be doing three different jobs away from, you know, my support base. And I had to weigh whether or not I would get more out of just staying and advancing in my current role or starting anew uh, in a market. And single me, if I was still single and was not locked down, I think that maybe I would try to go to a bigger market. I'd like to say that I had the balls to do that, <laughs> but I don't know. I don't know really if I would. Um, but there are just so, so many factors. And I'll be very blunt and very honest with you. I have a lot of good sources. It, I don't have Jody Barr sources. Rusty knows who I'm talking about there. But I've got a lot of good sources. Let me tell you something. G Jesus doesn't have Jody Barr sources, okay? Exactly, All exactly. Right. Uh, but I've made a lot of really great contacts and relationships in this. Oh, speaking of Quigs, here he is. Um, but you know what? I wouldn't. This is Quiggs. He's one of our. Hey. <laughs> All right. How you doing, man? I'm good. How are you? Listen, I bought tickets to go see your boy in March down here at the at, uh, playing the the Red Hot Timberwolves. I just want you to know that, okay? Hopefully, uh, he actually plays. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, he I'm not on this team. Not talking about Westbrook. I'm talking about LeBron. Oh, I know. I know. Uh, Brian Quigley, ladies and gentlemen, was my student ten years ago. 
old. He's old. old. <laughs> at Coastal Carolina, and a job came open at the TV station, working weekends, uh, helping produce the shows and get uh, all the tapes and stuff together. And I said, I know a guy who has a sense of humor and generally shows up on time. And uh, the rest is history. Brian directs, and he uh, helps produce the shows, like I said, and uh, he's generally a good sport. And he's he's Megan's adopted son as well. Yeah. So uh, he's a good guy. He is under the delusion that LeBron James is the greatest basketball player of all time. And so I'm excited to be able to go see for myself. Staff, staff matter. Okay. Uh, but I, I'm really glad you stopped in, buddy. It's good to see you. I, I've been thinking about you and, and uh, hope everything's good. Yeah, I saw you through the window and had to come by. Oh, so. my God. He's also... Well, He's also the biggest fan of Coastal Carolina University Sports 2016 oh, National really. Baseball Champions uh, of all time. So, yeah, sounds about right. I guess. Good, <laughs> good stuff, buddy. Take care of yourself. Bye, hey. Clegs. Love you, Mina. Um, yeah, so obviously lots of different personalities in a TV station. That's a beautiful thing about working here. But um, going back to that question, now that I'm almost 35 years old and so planted in this market, no way would I ever go to another market and start all over again. Took a lot of blood, sweat, and tears to get to where I'm at right now. And so I've just developed the mindset that I'm staying and my family's here and I'm perfectly happy here and I've got a great quality of life. So it just all depends on what, you know, what phase of life you're in. Absolutely. The, these folks uh, asked CJ, our speaker last week, Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was Chris asked her straight up. Do you think you'll stay in your current job? And she's like you, she's from this mm -hmm. area and she's working at the number one outlet in town and doing really great and worked her way up to, and uh, she was put on kind of pause and kind of on notice by that question because, <laughs> well, but because like you said a, a little bit ago, there's that drive to want to, yeah. whatever the case may be. Um, and, and Megan, you know, is now in the, in the, in a prime spot in a, a truly dominant TV station. Um, at one point when I was there, um, eight out of 10 televisions in Florence County were turned to our six o'clock news every night, eight out of 10 televisions that were turned on yeah. were tuned to our six o'clock news that that's unheard of in uh, most television markets. That's how dominant that station is not because of Megan and not because of me, but it's been on the air for 70 years yeah. and all that good stuff. And people trust it and, and, they invest in quality people and, and those kinds of things. Okay. Um, other questions for Megan before she has to go conquer the universe. Oh, uh, one other thing, you know, going off of your, uh, what was it? CJ? Was that her name? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Going off of that question. Um, the cool thing about television news and journalism is that when you do decide to hang it up, that there are so many different career avenues that you can go into um, that not only your relationships create, but the skills that you build here in this industry, you can go into marketing work, you can go into public relations, you can go and teach, you could be a public information officer for a local government, you can go into um, public safety, you can go into, you know, conference work and all of that stuff. And you can go and be um, a freelance journalist or a writer for different publications across the country or be, um, we have a guy who used to be a freelance or used to be a photog here. He's now freelancing for like NBC and the Weather Channel and just rolling in Benjamin. I mean, he, I, I'm convinced that he sleeps in a bed of hundred dollar bills. He's making such good money and traveling and whatnot. Right. So that's another cool thing about uh, journalism and pursuing this avenue, no matter what median you always have something to fall back on should you lose your passion, should you be, you know, a victim of a furlough, should you just say, you know what, I'm not built for this anymore. Uh, and that's the cool thing about journalism is that there's always going to be a good paying, solid job for you to fall back on where you're not learning new skills and where you can just seamlessly transition into a new role for a different organization. Good point. It's for that reason that I, I think I told you I have uh, Jill, uh, Jill es Esteves. I think that's how you say it. It's not yeah, Estevez. She's my, she yeah. my producer. I still can't figure out. Jill, <laughs> but Jill yeah, year. she was she was with us there, and then she went to work at yep. another station, and now she's uh, in marketing, uh, and yep. she lives here and works here in St. Paul. She's going to come speak to us uh, after spring break, I believe. So oh, I said hi. Uh, yeah, she's she's totally awesome. Um, more questions for Megan. I had one. Uh 
Okay, go ahead, Theo. Um, what are some of the tips or strategies you stick with when feature writing? I think the number one thing about feature writing, especially if you're doing like a profile on a person and an organization is to, like I said, when I get out to uh, a scene or a story to take it in and allow yourself to feel the environment and to feel the vibes from the person or the thing. And to also listen, listening is so important uh, in our industry because if you're not listening, you could miss the sound bite of the century, or you could miss the entire basis and feeling and vibe of your story. Um, so whenever you're doing feature reporting, always make sure that, yeah, you understand the organization, you understand the person, but you also convey to your viewers some of the emotions and some of the feelings that you were feeling um, in that moment while you were with that person. Um, my One of my stories, um, that I'm doing on this woman, Tammy Irwin at the sheriff's office, she just lit my soul on fire. I can't explain the vibes that she gave me. And so to get people into my story, I want to convey that in my anchor intro that she is like, is just a great person that automatically just turns your spirit on as soon as you, as soon as you meet her. Um, so I always like to let emotions and feelings drive my feature reporting because your viewer's not there. Um, your viewer has no idea what was going on behind the scenes. And that is truly how you can connect your viewer with your story and the people that you're interviewing. Good question. Thank yeah, that was you. a good question. Others. Going once. Crickets. We can do this. I have a quick question. Yeah. yeah, go for it. Go for it. Um, I was just curious what helped you, what's helped you avoid burnout in the last eight years since coming back from your break? That is that is such a good, such a good question. Um prior to those eight, the eight years that I'm currently in, I was at my station for four and a half years. And I lost the sense of who I was as Megan Miller. I, I'm Megan Miller also on air, but at the time I made a name was Megan Miller as well. And I let my job take over my life. And that is not healthy whatsoever, especially in this day and age. I was a young, I started at the TV station when I was 20 years old. I mean, I was young. I was like, yeah, let's live off of coffee and we'll go out and party all night. And then we'll go and do our job and be the coolest chick in town. And I was like really caught up um, in that while still focusing very heavily on my career, but I lost sense and sight of my true self. And I think in this industry, it's very important. And I've learned since then that it's very important to separate now Megan Miller, who I am on TV and who people know me as um, on screen and at events and, you know, when I'm out doing stories and Megan Nash, which is now my married name, the daughter, the human being, the wife, the soon to be mom, you know, those titles, the one who has separate friends from work, uh, you know, and real life. I just think it's especially for you guys going into it where we're having those really real conversations about burnout. The number one thing that you need to remember is that you are a person too. And also that no job is worth sacrificing your mental health, your emotional health, and your physical health. Because I let that happen to me. I was down to 99 pounds, popping ambience every night to sleep because I was so wired up and so stressed out and just not in a right frame of mind to where they were going to put me in the hospital if I didn't quit my job. Uh, and I was also on a very terrible schedule that did not let my body clock reset. And I was getting sick off of that. So when I came back to news, you know, and, you know, Rusty and I have had these very real conversations. Sometimes I feel myself slipping where those very distinct lines that I've made for myself and boundaries start to get a little blurred and you just need to stop it and not do it and give yourself that internal reality check every time that you are a person first, you are a journalist second. I don't know if Rusty will agree with me on that one, but 
you cannot be a good journalist if the personal you is hurting or is lacking. Um, so just always make sure to take care of yourself and find time to do things that bring you joy. Um, photography is mine. I love still photography and wildlife photography. And so I bought myself a pass to our state parks. We've got two of them right down the road from us. Um, and whenever I'm having a hard time or I feel those lines being blurred or I'm stressed out of work, I know that just going on the causeway, soaking in the salt air, being with my birds, I love birds, uh, and it, having that me time is going to allow me to reset myself and bring me joy, that, that raw joy um, that I need to feel in order to you know, keep on going. So always take care of yourself. That is so incredibly important, no matter what medium you go into, even if you don't go into journalism, um, always make sure that you're taking care of your mental, emotional, and physical health outside of work. I'm, st I'm still trying to figure out how to do that. Um, it's now, hard. It's so yeah, hard. Now almost six years since I left the station there, that was a humongous Oh yeah. Part of my identity. And I mean, I, I was a morning anchor there for eight years. I mean, I had, I had people saying I grew up watching rusty Ray on TV and I'm like, that, that just seems so bizarre to me. I had people, my daughter was born when Quiggs Brian was my student. That semester was when my daughter was born and people sent gifts to the TV station. People that I've never met before sent handmade blankets uh, i thought there was one over there blankets for us as a gift to me like that was i mean i was rusty ray like i was the guy on yep. tv i was the guy on the radio and like i tried to make a very clean break we knew we were going to move we wanted to live uh somewhere else we wanted to live here my wife grew up here that's how i ended up here and I thought, I'm never going to do this again. I'm not going to be on TV again. I'm going to grow a beard. I can do what I want. I can, I can slip <laughs> right into a marketing job. Somebody will hire me because look at my resume. I mean, I, I had steady work and I did all these things and I met all these people and I told all these stories. Well, I'm not from here. That makes it tough. And if I, if I tried to do that and try to work somewhere else in Myrtle Beach, I would have been a little more successful, I hope. Oh, um, you would well, but it took me, it took me a long time to, to find yeah. that. I, th I think my escape now is riding my bicycle, which when it's 12 degrees outside is not happening. Yeah. So the winters are a little tougher, but the six months, seven months of the year that I can, I'm out there exploring and enjoying um, the surroundings and stuff like that. But, yeah. it, and this is, again, I, I said this earlier, I was just talking to our, our, our colleague, our former colleague, uh, Trish, and she, I even said we should do a podcast and just talk about like, how do you like remove this whole notion? You know, Megan talked about all the things she has to do every day. You, you end up what, the good thing about journalism, TV journalism is that you're, you're, you know, when you start the day and when you end the yeah. day and what you have to do in between, and it's the same every day. And so you have to make a story happen and you have to think of it, go find it, go shoot it, come back, edit it, write it. And then it goes on television. And so, or when you're producing a newscast, you have to know that you have to get all these things done. And then the show goes on the air or anchor it too. And I can back time a trip to the grocery store. Like I know that, okay, we got to do this. Like we're, we're getting on an airplane this evening at six o'clock. My family. Very it's a very regimented schedule. Yeah. And, and, I, and I'm already back. Life. Yeah. I'm back timing a whole day, getting a flight, yeah. a flight like this, especially when they're taking our kids somewhere. Is stressful because I'm back timing the whole thing in my head. And then my wife's like, well, we should do this. I'm like, no, 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 no. We should do this. You know, it's very tough, but it's, it's, <clears throat> it's really, it's really strange and it's really tough. And my new job here, we do a show every week, but we also try to have longer form talk segments and talk show, um, you know, unedited interviews in our studio, especially with political candidates. And I've really come to enjoy that. It doesn't make my questions any better. My interview questions are still terrible, but um, like you, you just, I missed it. And I, and it's what I do. This is what I do. And I'm, I'm thankful that I'm able to still do it on a much different scale and a much different audience. And I'm still able to do this to teach and um, still able to do video production for my church and other things like that. But all those things that Megan said is you, you cannot lose sight of it. And that also, I think that also should inform a job search. I just, 
I tell people this all the time. If you don't want to live in Florida, don't apply for a job in Florida. Yeah. If you don't want to work weekends, now starting out, you may not have that luxury. You may not. But if you do not want to work weekends, don't apply for a job where you have to work weekends. If you don't want to live a thousand miles away from your mom or your girlfriend or whatever the case, then don't apply for a job there. Don't. Because then you're, you're already setting yourself up to be like, well, I shouldn't have, but I had to, okay, don't do that. Because then you will lose sight of those things. And you're already starting out. And that's my opinion. This is my yeah. opinion. You do whatever you think is right for you. But if you're starting out losing that side of that, and that's tough, that's really tough in, in this business. Um, Especially for young reporters yeah. too. I think we, we have a lot of conversations in different professional Facebook groups um, with brand new reporters coming out of college. They're like, I moved 1500 miles away from my family. Um, my newsroom environment is toxic. Um, you know, I don't have any friends here. I don't, you know, I don't know what to do in my free time. I'm just consumed by work and what do I do? You know, those are very real conversations that brand new journalists are having um, in our industry. And I'll tell you, living near my parents eased that. That helped me. Um, and when you're going on the job hunts and you're looking at jobs, do not discount the feeling that you get in your stomach and your heart. Always listen to your gut in this industry, especially when it comes to where you're going to make your move next, uh, because there is nothing worse than moving from people that I've heard moving across the country and being extremely miserable, being in a good place and in a good town and a good community in a healthy newsroom honestly makes and breaks reporters in their first two to three years uh, in this business and can truly shape how you see the business moving forward. I'm in a great healthy newsroom right now. I have been in terribly toxic newsrooms and that's being in a toxic work environment is something I would never wish on my biggest enemy. So that's always important. Always important. Good stuff. All right. Final yeah. questions for Megan. Anybody? All right. We did good, Russ. We, we did, did good. good. You guys, have, good. You guys yeah. have such a good professor um, and Russ. I hope you soak everything he knows and his knowledge and his expertise in while you can, because and I'm not saying this to blow smoke up you, Russ, but you know, he truly helped me launch my career. And I know that he still has that same drive, uh, you know, to help people launch theirs. So take full advantage of Rusty while you have him. And if there's any other questions you have, please don't hesitate um, to reach out to me. I'm always here to coach the next generation of journalists. I appreciate those things you said. Yeah. That, that means the world to me. You mean the world to me. And um, thank you for your time this morning amid your busy schedule. Yeah, it's fun. Um, Good break. <laughs> my, my best to Chris, my best yes. to Val and Jeff and Jenna. Yes. And uh, tell them all congratulations. Um, thank you for your time. Folks, uh, don't go anywhere. We're going to let Megan go, but we have a couple of housekeeping things. Meg, love you to death. Thank you so all much. All right. Love you guys. Thank you so much. And best of luck on your next steps in your journey. Bye-bye. Thank you. Good stuff, man. Things got really heavy there. So, uh, with, with, but she's right. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it, it, these are all things to, to consider and, and amid all the other heavy stuff of, of late with uh, the pandemic and just reevaluating how we do things, why we do things. Um, it, it's, it's crazy. It's really crazy. Megan's, a, Megan's great. She's really great. It's first, first time she's spoken to my students here in Minnesota. So I was really glad that, that she was able to do that. Um, I had, a, I guess I, I posted the podcast uh, assignment. We went over it in class. Uh, and then I realized it was part of the module for this week, which wasn't published. So I think I fixed that. Um, if, if still, if you're having trouble accessing the actual assignment to get the links and to find out what I want you to do, I'm sorry for that. I, I realized yesterday, I think through an email back and forth with uh, a student that um, I had not published the module that it was in and I didn't realize that. So it should be there. Uh, do you, does anyone have any questions about uh, or anything to add about the podcast assignment so far? <laughs> 